Recording in progress. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Noel Kassler podcast. Broke out the beautiful McAllister. I don't know what I was just playing. This guitar kind of plays you. Beautiful sound. I guess uh, Mike doesn't really pick it up, but... Gig Harbor, Washington by Roy McAllister. He builds guitars for David Crosby and Jackson Brown, among others. One man operation, but it's the real deal. Anyway, let's get to it. Sorry to waste your time. Let's talk midterms. It worked out, didn't it? A lot better than we thought. We averted disaster. You know, there was no red wave. There was no real horrific reversal in in the sort of balance of Congress and the Senate. It looks like we're going to keep the Senate pretty much as it was. And, you know, the Republicans may pick up a seat or two in the House, but it's not the bloodbath we had been promised, you know, and that they sort of tried to engineer and foist on us with all the fake polling and the media narrative, which was irresistible. You know, at the mainstream sort of corporate level, New York Times and people couldn't resist because it was going to be a big story. Imagine the breathless coverage we would have right now had the Democrats performed poorly on Tuesday, right? You'd have, you know, think pieces on what Kevin McCarthy's speakership will mean for the country. You'd have gloating. You'd have snarky frat bros on, you know, Fox News trying to rub it in our faces And instead, we have the opposite, right? Young people showed up and voted, right? They made the difference. And they were still a relatively small percentage of folks in that demographic that actually showed up, but enough of them did to make a difference. And next time, it'll be even more, right? Because the younger generation is not accepting the same bullshit as the older generations, right? Do you know how uncool it is to be homophobic? to be anti-transgender, to be anti-Semitic, to be racist if you're a young person, right? Woke isn't a term that's derisive in their minds, right? People aspire to equality now. They don't accept the status quo when it comes to stuff like that, you know? And that's what the GOP realized, you know? That, that's what they're saying now is, God, somehow we got to stop young people from voting. <laughs> that's their solution to their dwindling minority and the fact that their fascism failed, right? They ran on hate and fear, fear of crime and stuff, you know, and and mostly it was rejected. Where I live, it was accepted, the Hudson Valley, and we'll get into that, you know? And it's part of the cultural thing that I've been talking about this whole time, if you've been listening to this podcast. You know, every time I bring up these pickup trucks and these beard bros with their screaming eagle stickers and their NRA bullshit, that's what it's about. You know, it's about sort of enervating that generation that's parents and grandparents fled the cities for the suburbs and exurbs and sort of grew up with this subtle kitchen table racism. But, you know, they basically are good people, but they just don't like the other and they're scared of the city and immigration is taking their jobs and all the kind of tropes that have been handed back and forth by your racist uncle or whatever, you know, for for generations. And I grew up around here. I grew up in Putnam Valley. You know, that's where I went to high school. And that's what people talked like in the Reagan era. You know, what we're seeing now is almost, you know, Reagan era on steroids when it comes to Lee Atwater's Southern strategy and that kind of stuff. Like it's not dog whistles anymore. It's pretty much out in the open. And Lee Zeldin ran for governor in New York and was thankfully repudiated at the polls, but he had $12 billion from Ron Lauder. Ron Lauder is the heir to Estee Lauder Cosmetics, obviously, and a 
you know, a billionaire doesn't want to pay his fair share. So he saw an opening with that, you know, with the rising crime in the city, which is real. And he tried to, you know, move that on to New York. He tried to foist that on to New York State, and he illegally paid for a campaign that said, Save Our State, Lee Zeldin. And that was illegal collusion. You know, it was a, it was a violation of campaign finance laws to, to coordinate with an outside super PAC like Zeldin did. And they called him on it, and the board was going to meet. And then the two Republicans that served on the board refused to show up so they couldn't vote on it and get a quorum and do anything about it right so he got away with it but it failed ultimately anyway but the the gerrymandering kind of failed and that gets complicated i won't get into it but you know democrats share some of the blame for losing new york state um my congressman in new york 17 lost sean patrick maloney and you know he lost at his own hand you know he, he could have been smarter and more adept and in the future we're going to be that you know and we're going to address these issues because it really is a cultural thing and a big chunk of our population is still brainwashed and buying that bs but ultimately at a national level we are not and that is good news you know so let's celebrate for a minute let's think about biden you know i was talking about those accomplishments and the kind of bullet points talking points i got on my White House visit, and it was true, and it was effective, and we helped get the word out there. You know, I think these hashtags that we were pushing and all this kind of stuff, I saw it work. I was in these online groups every day. I was on an hour-long meeting, you know, with people that are very close to the administration and to Speaker Pelosi. You know, they're the arm that does the political stuff, right? Because the Hatch Act, you can't really campaign 100%, you know, from your official capacity, unless it's a rally or something. But you know, I, I saw the efforts and I saw like what a billion impressions meant, you know, how many hundreds of millions of people saw this stuff. And you felt in the last week the narrative shift, right? It was no longer a oh, red wave. It's a tsunami. It shifted back to like, you know, vote blue, show up and vote because people heard those issues. They heard their Social Security was on the chopping block. They heard their health care and their entitlements and their prescription drug costs. And all these things that Biden has delivered on were in jeopardy and people didn't accept it. They showed up, you know, and that's why I was driving around Pennsylvania and all these places and making videos and stuff because I was, you know, it's a con. And when you point out the truth to people, you know, they don't want to vote against their self-interest. You know, if you, if you hold it up to a little bit of light and facts, people respond. And the GOP had no plan, right? They were just fear, right? And they had crazy awful candidates <laughs> you know some of which are still in the running i guess carrie lake but you know dr oz didn't win in pennsylvania you know that alone is halle freaking luya right because we did not need that i did not need six years of dr oz trying to sell fish oils on the floor of the senate <laughs> so thankfully we were spared you know and you know shout out to barack obama former president obama because if you heard his speech in philly which i was invited to by the way and i didn't go because I thought I'd be better off here at home trying to flip things. And I don't know if it worked, right? Because my district lost. But, you know, my point in that is politics are local. I live in New York. So a few days out from the election, my business is here, not in Philly, as much as I would have loved to have been at that rally. But I did get to watch it. And it was amazing hearing him talk. He's a great orator. He's a great way he has a great way of connecting what these programs mean, you know, what Obamacare meant. We have never had more people with health insurance in this country than we do now, you know, and the only time I've really had health insurance in my life is Obamacare on, right? So the last however many years it is, you know, 14 years or something. It was sporadic before that. It was based on, you know, what job I had. And nobody should have to stay in a job to get health care, which a lot of people do. And it's a sad thing because you're, you're hobbling somebody's life and the options, right? Because maybe you don't want to stay at that gig forever, but you can't risk jeopardizing your health or your family's health care by leaving. You know, and you only get one life. That's not a really good way to cultivate the best in your, in your people, in your population. You know, it's much better to not attach that with your career, right it should just be a universal basic right and then you go out and do what you need to do you don't you know having to pick your job based on your health care is a uniquely american 
thing and it's not cool. So when you start to explain that to people, you know, that, that progress is a real thing that will enrich us all and lift all boats, right? It makes sense. It's better than hate. It's better than division. It's better than the con that's been run on the American people, you know, for a long time, if you want to look at it at an ideological level, but certainly, you know, in a Ponzi scheme, shell game, Trump con man way since 2016, and it, I think we saw the end of that on Tuesday. You know, I, I think it was the end of Trumpism in terms of Trump as a figurehead, right? It's certainly not the end of MAGA, right? Ron DeSantis is going to carry on the mantle and we'll get into all that in a minute, right? And the feud that's quickly going to brew between them. But in terms of Trump having power, in terms of the people he picked losing, you know, J.D. Vance won in Ohio, but... You know, for the most part, Dr. Oz and all these other clowns, all the secretary of states that I tried to warn people about that these election deniers that were running on the GOP ticket, you know, at a local level and a state level, those guys were kicked to the curb, man. People didn't play. They didn't they didn't want any of that stuff. And that was Trump's game. That was what he had left was fealty to his ego. And it's now crumbled, right? Rupert Murdoch has turned on him. <laughs> when Rupert Murdoch turns on Donald Trump, it's basically over for Donald Trump, and he knows it, you know? All he has left are the minions now, right? He's got the, the deadheads, so to speak, and, you know, I'm a, <laughs> I'm a deadhead, so I don't mean no diss, but you know what I mean? He's got the diehards that are going to show up at the rallies, the mentally ill, right? He, he exploits mental illness, and I don't mean that in an unempathetic way, right? We all have mental illness hygiene to deal with you know i'm in recovery that is the definition of having mental illness you know i have a compulsion i have alcoholism to, you know if i put a drink in me i'm not the sanest cat in the world and i got to do a lot of work without a drink to just maintain an equilibrium right but there's a lot of people in this country who haven't done that work and are disaffected and are sort of not just disenfranchised on a genuine level but have sort of you know they're not well, you know, there's no other way to put it. I saw a guy on Route 35 in Katona on Election Day holding up a big, huge sign and it said, Democrats are Satanists, right? That never happened before, right? You'd see one or two of those guys at Columbus Circle in the city or on the Lafayette Park across from the White House. There was always mentally ill people on the fringes of our society. They ended up on the streets after Reagan deregulated you know, and defunded mental health institutions at a public level in this country. But for the most part, they weren't an active part of a political party like they are now with Trump, you know. And seeing that guy, he was like in his 50s, you know, or, or older, or 60s. So he's living in someone's basement, you know, just up the road, and it's election day. And he walks down to Route 35 and holds up a sign. And this is like a rural kind of road. This is northern Westchester, if you know it, you know. It's a couple towns north of where the Clintons live, actually. It's not the kind of place where you're going to reach a lot of people, and it's not the kind of place where you would normally have that behavior. But that's what Trump gifted America, was calling on and weaponizing and activating a vast swath of our country and, and sort of hitting their psychological weak points and pressure points and getting them to to act on his behalf. And, you know, he did that with a huge assist from Putin and all the psychological psyops that they micro-targeted people with in 2016 that Jared Kushner helped coordinate, right? That's why Jared got in touch with his buddies at Palo Alto at Facebook, you know, and figured out how to, like, find the guys that voted for Obama but were in a union and had a gun, you know what I mean, and a Kid Rock CD or whatever. So they were able to be like, hey, Democrats are pedophiles, Democrats are predators. You know, and they got very specific and surgical with that stuff. They knew the demographics where they would have people that were victims of sexual abuse and stuff. And they, they coordinated this kind of stuff to, to hit those people. That's what Pizzagate was and all this kind of stuff. And there was also an added bonus of sort of covering for Trump's frailties, you know, and defects, if that's how you want to call it, because he's very much a sexual predator and he's very vulnerable on that issue and had a lot of exposure, not just with the 25 women who came publicly forward during his campaign and said that he had sexually not just harassed them, assaulted them, raped them, 
he had all the, you know, Jeffrey Epstein connections and his very public taste for younger women, which you've heard me talk about. I worked on <laughs> those things and I don't need to get into that now. But so it was a vulnerable issue that the, the sooner they flipped it on the Democrats, the better off they were. And they did it when we weren't even paying attention. Right. Putin studied judo. So we understand psychological judo, using your opponent's sort of weight against them. And that's kind of what they did on a psychological level, if you're following me and that makes sense. And they started doing that six years ago. So they have an army now that they can activate to extremism, right? Which is how terrorism operates the world over. But that army wasn't enough to give them an electoral victory. Because the rest of the party has been peopled with such miscreants, you know, such just outright wackadoodles, you know, that unless they're in a deep red place and it's completely gerrymandered, like Texas, South, you know, North Georgia, where Marjorie Taylor Greene came from, you know, Colorado, thankfully, it looks like, you know, Bobert's not going to come back. I don't know what the, I've been waiting to actually record the podcast to get the results of that, but it's taken too long and please don't send her back. <laughs> okay, Colorado, because that was like, remember when she and Marjorie Taylor Greene heckled Joe Biden last year at the State of the Union? I mean, think of that. For that one act alone, she should have been kicked out of Congress, let alone what they both did prior to January 6th and during January 6th where, you know, Lauren Boebert actually texted out the location of Nancy Pelosi so her mobs that she had given tours of the night before could find her and do her harm, you know? So for that alone, they should have been out of Congress, but it looks like Colorado's going to choose some sanity, hopefully, you know? And, and, and that's, you know, as I just mentioned, Lauren Boebert in, like, you know, tweeting out Speaker Pelosi's location on January 6th. I think the attack on Paul... Pelosi had a galvanizing effect on voters. I think people saw the reaction of the GOP immediately where they started joking about it and making fun, you know, of an 80 octogenarian getting attacked with a hammer while he's in bed at his home, right? What, what could be more despicable, alarming, and terrifying than something like that happening to somebody for no other reason you know, then their wife serves in Congress, right? And is the de facto enemy and target of the GOP because they don't have any substance to run on and they haven't since the Tea Party took over in 2010. So they just make a villain of a smart, capable woman who's a natural born leader and kicks their ass every chance she gets, right? ACA, Obamacare, was passed because of Nancy Pelosi, okay? She's the one who got the work done behind the scenes to get it through the House. And she kicked ass and it terrified these little men like Ted Cruz, you know, these guys who hide behind the Federalist Society and all this stuff. These guys are cowards at heart. That's who the people are that are attracted to the GOP, right? Real men don't need toxic iconography to feel cool, right? Real men take care of their families and vulnerable people in their community and stick out their hand and use their strength to lift up others. Scared men try to intimidate others with fear and, you know, the trappings of brute force and physical strength. But what it really re reveals is a, a cowardness, you know? It, it, it's like Bruce Lee versus Rambo. Do you know what I'm saying? And, and the GOP is Rambo. They've always been like the dumbest idea of what an American is. I'm a patriot. I got a gun. You know? No, you're an idiot. And you're getting manipulated by billionaires that do not have your best interest at heart. Right? But in some places, that has become... I'm sorry, this mic is very loud today. That has become so... Um, ingrained in this culture that we don't stand a chance. Right? So let me just do the Paul Pelosi thing. So I think that that turned a lot of people away. You know, I think a lot of people, I don't think anybody's on the fence at this point. You know, you're either a Democrat or Republican. It's hard to be in the middle. <laughs> you know, do you like fascism or do you like food? You know, do you like health care and free lunch or do you like, you know, and free lunch for, for people who need it, right, for children? Or do you like being snarky and, and clapping and cheering on a leader who's got about 10 cases in front of the DOJ right now because he's a lifelong criminal and all he wants is your money, you know? 
which is another thing. Trump took all the money for two years and didn't spend it on any of these candidates. <laughs> so that might have helped, too, if they'd actually taken the money and spent it in the districts instead of spending it to refurbish his plane. <laughs> right. But they deserve it. And, uh, you know, they, they reaped the results of it where there was a chance for a fair election. Which brings us to Florida, which is clearly not a fair thing. And they picked up three or four congressional seats, flipped the districts. Red, based on a map that Ron DeSantis drew himself, he redistricted Florida, drawing new congressional districts to disenfranchise predominantly black communities and black voters to favor Republicans. And it worked because nobody could do anything about it. Okay, and then you had Miami-Dade County, where you have all the Cubans that voted for Marco Rubio over Val Demings. You know, a completely 100% qualified, obvious great leader who deserves to be in Biden's cabinet, along with Sherry Beasley in North Carolina. And I hope they find a place for them in the future if an opening happens to open, you know, if the opportunity arises, right? But Florida chose Marco Rubio, a guy who can't be bothered to show up in the Senate. You know, he's just got a perpetual smug look on his face like he'd rather be anywhere else because he would. He had the lowest attendance score of any senator. OK. But they voted for him again. Right. Because, you know, Miami-Dade, Southern Florida, it's the Cubans that got kicked out of Havana. You know, it was kind of like the rich, hardcore right wing Cubans are the ones that all fled to Florida. So it's obviously easy to manipulate that demographic and uh, to wield power in Eternally. So, you know, that became not a contest. And then you had the gerrymandering that Ron DeSantis did, you know, and his complete aping of Trumpism down to the, the poorly cut Brioni suit and the pudgy face and the, you know, the hand gestures and all the kind of like trappings of, of toxic iconography, right? I was down there. I'm heading back down there to, to, to see what the aftermath is like because I, I feel like we need to study what's happening down there to change it on a national level, to change it back here in New York State, where the same culture is, is taking root, and, and not by accident, right? There's a pretty symbiotic relationship between Florida and New York. Florida could almost be a suburb of New York <laughs> in, in some ways. So, you know, we have to address this cultural issues, and we have to talk about Florida in terms of, like, what happened in 2018, okay? So, so... DeSantis wins on Tuesday. Murdoch says that night, like, this is our guy, anoints the new king, does a couple of post covers completely mocking Trump, which has sent Trump into the, you know, stratosphere in terms of raging. And I feel sorry for anybody who's going to be at Tiffany's wedding in Mar-a-Lago this weekend, because that is not going to be a good time. Don Jr. fell off the planet. He hasn't tweeted since Tuesday, since the election, and he tweeted out bloodbath and then disappeared, right? So somebody needs to do a wellness check, <laughs> make sure he didn't get any fentanyl in his eight ball. But nobody's going to do a wellness check, let's be honest. You know, that's the other thing about that family is the guy's been having a public relapse for two years and nobody cares. Nobody sent him to rehab. Nobody's done an intervention. You know, he was dry when I worked around them. He struggled with addiction his whole life, as others have in that family. And they just do not look out for each other. <laughs> but uh, not that you can ultimately do anything anyway if somebody doesn't want help. But you kind of could be like, hey, dude, maybe stop making the videos where you're obviously high out of your mind. But anyway, I digress. So I feel sorry for anybody who's going to be at the wedding of the century at Mar-a-Lago. So Tiffany, you know, marries her her Lagos Nigerian prince, right? But he's a Greek guy whose family lived in Nigeria. So I'm sure that's all up and up, you know. <laughs> I'm sure the money they've made is all legit and they're not exploiting that country at all. That's sarcasm. Anyway, it makes sense that, that she's marrying, you know, somebody who who re reflects the values of the Trump clan. But um, so anyway... So DeSantis loses, Murdoch sort of anoints him as the new, you know, heir apparent to MAGAism, and Trump loses it, goes on his, you know, truth social last night and rages on DeSantis and says, admits something that we did not know before completely. He says he used the FBI to shut down the vote counting in Broward County and I think Miami-Dade or something to help Rick Scott 
and DeSantis win. Okay, so DeSantis was behind in the polls in that race to Andrew Gillum, the former mayor of Tallahassee, who used racism to run against. If you remember, he said, let's not monkey this up, right? Wink, wink, you know, vote for me. But he was behind in the polls. He ended up winning by 30,000 votes, which is, I think, 1.2 percent, which is nothing, right? Rick Scott ended up voting, you know, winning by 10,000 votes, right? So these guys both win by, you know, a hair, a fraction of a percentage in terms of the population because the voting was shut down. And Trump's claiming that he sent the FBI and the state's attorney or something, you know, U.S. attorney in there to shut it down. And it's like, what? You know, how did we not know this? And where is Merrick Garland? Where is the FBI? You know, the FBI then goes to DeSantis when he takes office and says, we have evidence that the Russians were able to get malware in two counties in Florida and disrupt the vote tallies and the voter registration rolls, meaning they could delete every other vote for, you know, for Hillary Clinton back then or for Trump or whatever, you know, or they could just kick off Republican or Democratic voters, right? So they, they're like, we have proof that the Russians have infiltrated these counties and put this stuff into these machines. And they told DeSantis about it and inexplicably, inexplicably made him sign an NDA that he wouldn't reveal what those counties were, okay? And DeSantis went and bragged about it at a press conference later and then said, but I can't tell you you know, where it happened. And now we know, <laughs> right? Thanks to Trump's big mouth, we know that it helped happened in those counties that were also shut down. Okay. So I know this is hard to follow. This is all true. You can look it up in Bob Woodward's book called uh, Rage. That's where we first learned about that interference and Mueller has it documented as well. And so when you go back forensically and you start con connecting the dots, it's like, dude, they haven't had a fair election down there you know, anecdotally since 2000, right? Since Bush v. Gore and the Brooks Brothers riots, which all, by the way, was the same Roger Stone, <laughs> you know, Paul, what's his name? You know, the, the Manafort, all these same bad actors were involved in Trump's thing. But basically what I'm trying to say is they stole the election. You know, DeSantis stole the election in 18, you know, with help from the Russians, with help from Trump. And it's all the same monster, you know, on a, on a local level, with help from Matt Gates, who was one of the main guys, stopping the vote count, yelling at people like, we're done, our guy won. And he got away with it. And then he became governor. And now he's locked that state down. And he's turned it into a branding. You know, he's improved on the Trump brand, right? He has his own flags. He has Florida Free State. He has racist white alligators, you know, and election police and all this kind of stuff. The white alligator is like on their flag, you know, their don't tread on me BS, right? Iconography, right? Branding, because dudes eat that stuff up, especially white dudes, you know, especially dudes that are, you know, kind of have boring jobs or whatever. They feel powerless. They want to feel like warriors. You know, they play Call of Duty all day in mom's basement, you know, or, or the wife's basement. You know, we have a big generation of American males that are like perpetually adolescent, right? They go see Marvel movies every weekend. You know, they collect comic books. You know, they play video games. All of that is fine to an extent. I'm trying to make a psychological point. You know, cultural sophistication has not been, you know, has not been uh, rewarded in conservative NASCAR, you know, red state society for some time, right? So you set the stage with that stuff and then you bring in these sort of charismatic leaders that have all this cool shit and you can wear a t-shirt and then you see your brother's got the same t-shirt and you're both warriors for freedom, you know? That stuff becomes irresistible to these guys, right? And DeSantis is minting them. You know, he's going from out of state and pulling them down there to Florida. Dudes who fit that description that I know that I went to high school with are moving down there and they can't wait to move down there because it's like, come down here. You won't pay any taxes. You know, we do it the old fashioned way. White man rules, you know, carry a gun, shoot anybody you want, stay in your ground. All these horrible things, horrible things, you know, are being offered up, you know, as a lifestyle. It's aspirational. Come benefit in fascism, you know? Come revel in the glory with me. Meanwhile, he's going to screw them all over in the end, right? And it's going to be a huge fight between he and Trump. 
for who gets that nomination, and we'll get into that. But let's not gloss over that revelation from Trump last night, because in normal times, that would have been insane. It would have been another one of these news things that we heard about and freaked out about, and obviously nothing really ever happens to them. <laughs> so I think people are so tired that that one barely got any traction. I tried to kick it around Twitter a few times. You know, and the, the people who pay attention to this stuff were like, wait, what? Right? But now Monday morning, or the next morning, rather, Friday morning, Elon Musk is back to his antics, you know, which are no accident. It's no accident that Twitter happens to be dying at the same time that Putin's, you know, illegal and inhumane, you know, invasion of Ukraine is falling on its ass and his troops are retreating in ignominy, right? Shamed on the world stage because they're all obviously criminals and war criminals and they committed heinous atrocities in the last year and now they're getting their asses kicked and running away. Putin doesn't want that going viral on Twitter every five minutes, you know? KSA, Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, doesn't want that happening. So, hey, you bring in the chaos agent, buy the thing a week before the election and shut it all down. And that's what we're happening. That's what we're seeing happen, right? That's aiding the, the fascist movement around the world. And it's all connected, right? It's all billionaires pulling the stunts, you know, on behalf of sort of bad actors the world over. And authoritarians that basically have the same formula like you ride with me you get to be an oligarch you don't have to pay taxes you get to do whatever you want you know and we'll be reinforced by the troops right by the guys that wear our brand that wear our t-shirt and we'll give them red meat right we'll give them pickup trucks and guns and they get to own the libs right look at all the snarky people still cheering on elon musk as twitter becomes a dumpster fire you know it's fun for those bros to make fun of me or whatever, you know, and be like, hey, what do you care about Twitter? You know, it's, he can do whatever he wants with his money. But think of what he could have done with that money, right? He could have woken up any morning and said, I'm going to end childhood poverty. You know, I'm going to pay off student debt. I'm going to make sure people have prescription drugs that they can afford. I'm going to make sure people have health care. I'm going to protect the environment on and on and on. I'm going to help the, the refugees and victims of floods and famines the world over. Nope. I'm going to buy something for $44 billion and destroy it in a week to help the cause of authoritarianism and make freedom and free speech that much harder. Right? The first thing that happened when he took over a week ago Friday, I shared my podcast and a warning was attached. attached. And many of you listeners know, when you listen to this now, and I share it on Twitter, uh, the pod being, being leaked, link, a warning pops up. If you go to like it, if I say Noel Kassler podcast episode 85 is out now, which I'll do in an hour from now, you can watch. Go to, go to like it on my Twitter page and a warning is going to pop up saying, do you really want to like this tweet? This could be from a you know malicious website, right? And literally at like, you know, before I started recording at 1130, he tweeted out, I'm trying to make Twitter, you know, the greatest, you know, I'm paraphrasing, the greatest thing in the world for civilian journalists. It's like, no, you're not. You know, you got a guy who's got comedy in his Twitter handle and you're putting warnings on his podcast because he's giving you a hard time, you know. And I'm not arrogant enough to think Elon's sitting around listening to my podcast, but he's probably seen my tweets when I used to be allowed to tag him in them and I can't even tag him anymore. I was... I was going after him a little this morning <laughs> with some snark and I tried to tag him and I don't have that feature. You know, I can't publicly call him out because he's a thin skinned little egomaniac, right? He's a narcissist, you know, he, he's a damaged human being who thinks money can, can sort of fill that hole inside of him. And he thinks getting cheered on by other idiots who aspire to that kind of ignorance and brutality it is is a substitute for love and empathy. And it's not, you know? Elon's going to die a broken man. No matter how much money he has, whatever last breath that guy takes, he's going to be like, oh, crap, I blew it, right? You can't take the money with you. It doesn't matter in the end. It only matters in terms of how you can use it to enrich societies, 
You know, loving people is what matters. Helping people is what matters. Being of service to others is how you should orient yourself if you want to have a fulfilled life, right? Because life isn't easy for anybody. Nobody rides for free, you know, as my buddy Jackson Brown says, you know. Nobody gets out of here for free. Everybody's got to wait, right? Everybody's got suffering. Everybody has hardship. And the goal in life is to let those things not harden your heart, but open your heart open you to love and compassion and empathy and then you see everything as a blessing right because then you cultivate gratitude right and when you get gratitude you realize i already have enough i'm already lucky you know this is a beautiful ride and it's over in the blink of an eye right for any of us you know if you live to be a hundred that's nothing it's a nanosecond in the grand scheme of things you know go climb up on a mountain and see how long that mountain's been there you know, you're here like a shooting star going across the night sky and you might as well leave a trail of love. You know, you might as well be like, well, I left it all on the field. You know, I did as much as I could when I was aware, you know, because we're not always aware. It's a journey to get there. Right. You got to deal with your own BS. You got to heal yourself, put your air mask on first, and then you can help others because you have experience and empathy, You you know. It's like the para parable in AA, you know, there's a story where I think I told it last week, you know, a guy's in a hole and he's like, he looks up at somebody, he's like, I need help. And the guy jumps down in the hole and the guy's like, why did you do that? Now we're both stuck. He goes, no, nah, I've been here before. I know the way out, right? That's what you get when you sort of conquer your own demons and deal with your own BS. You get to be useful to other people based on your own experience. And people respond to that. You know, that's the true hero's journey is like the flawed warrior, right? The wounded healer, the idea of like, I've come from the other side, right? That's what Siddhartha is about, right? St. Augustine, same sort of parables, right? You know, it's about like, hey, I tried all the bad stuff. That doesn't work. Let me try the good stuff. You know, let me try what you say. Let me surrender to the obvious forces of good, you know, in the universe, the things that aren't about me and what I can take and my own ego and my own avarice, my own temptations and desires, right? Because we're all filled with desire, you know, and some of us, that stuff runs amok, you know, natural instincts get exaggerated and they become compulsive, right? And then you act upon that and then you sort of gather power, based on that because you're trying to protect that because it doesn't last right it's it's fleeting and you need more and more it's like being a drug addict you know you got to keep doing more to get the same buzz and then at a certain point you're hooked and you just need it for a maintenance level and that's when things get really screwy because everything goes out the window you lose all sense of morality because you're lost you know you're lost in yourself you're drowning in a glass of water as carlos santana said to me you know about his friend who killed himself he couldn't see the big picture he was l drowning in a glass of water which is a latin saying apparently and carlos i've told the story before carlos you know i was doing a, a show in uh latin grammys in houston texas with my uh my buddy jose feliciano and his family and we were sitting around a table at lunchtime in rehearsals and uh carlos santana came over to say hi to Jose and I love Carlos Santana. I'm a guitar player. You know, who doesn't? And Carlos comes over and I walk over to Carlos and I'm like, hey man, I heard you say that thing on a documentary once about your friend who was drowning in a glass of water. You know, he couldn't see the big picture. And that really helped me get on my own spiritual journey. And Carlos said, get up, come over here. And he made me get up and walk over to him. So now I'm standing up facing Carlos Santana. He looks at me, he goes, look into my eyes. Look deep into my eyes. And I look deep into his eyes, and they're like these brown saucers, you know, like these pools of wisdom, very welcoming. And he goes, my life and your life have meaning, and the universe has purpose. My life touches his heart, and your life touches my heart. Have meaning, and the universe has purpose, you know. Or our lives have purpose, and the universe has meaning. You can switch it either way you want it. It's the same sentence, you know, the same sentiment. You know, he goes, that's the meaning of life. 
that's what matters. You know, he's like, you want to know the meaning of life? That's it. There's a reason you're here. Your job is to figure that out and understand that it's part of a greater purpose. You know, it's like I always talk about when you look at a fish in the water, you see it's got all these scales. And if you see some sunlight, you know, go on the scales, you'll see a rainbow. But if you look at the scales individually, they're all different colored, right? Some are silver, some are dark, some are brown. Like you look at a rainbow trout or something. Some are kind of greenish. You know, they got all these, some have speckles. They're all different, right? But when the sunlight hits it and that fish is moving through the water, it's a rainbow, right? That's what we are as people. We all have differences. We all come from different places. We're different colors, different color hair, different color skin, you know? But we all have eyes and ears and mouths and tongues you know, and feet to carry us, you know, and people we love and stories to tell, right? And when that all works together, it's beautiful. And it's as the world is intended to be, you know, we're here to live in harmony. We're not here to live in fear, you know, we're, we're here to like help others achieve. There's no better way to make your dreams come true than to help somebody else live their dream, you know? That's the quickest way to get in what you want. I learned that from Oprah, you know, who finally shout out, you know, disavowed Dr. Oz. I think Oprah helped a little bit too, you know. I know people are mad at Oprah for foisting him on us, but, you know, it was a business, you know. She didn't know he was going to become what he became, you know. She probably knew after he'd been on air for a while, but you have contracts, you know. That's neither here nor there, but... I, I think I've told the Oprah stories before. I worked with Oprah and uh, on some shows, and I'll tell you those stories sometime. But, uh, you know, I learned that from Oprah. You know, it's like wanting, you know, wanting others to achieve is a very noble thing, and you don't have, a lot of, have to have a lot of money to do that, you know? It's not like, oh, when I get a million dollars, I'll buy a bunch of instruments for kids in schools or something. Like, you don't need money to be a force of good in the world, right? You need a spiritual balance and you need the desire to spread love and joy. You know, somebody went and asked Mother Teresa once about enlightenment, you know, how they could achieve enlightenment, you know, how they could be more godlike. And she was like, you want to be like Jesus? Go out in the street right now. This is in Calcutta or somewhere. Find the, you know, find somebody who's hungry and suffering and sick sitting on the street and be there with them. Let them know they're not alone. Help them, you know? Help them. That's, that's the root of it all. Love, help other creatures. It doesn't have to be a person. That's why I'm always talking about bugs and stuff on this show, because when you, when you really begin to become aware of what life is really about, and you achieve that awareness, you see that kindness is an option in every moment, you know? Even if you're just being kind to yourself, even if you're just remembering to breathe like I just did, which I never do in a breathless hour of me, you know, giving a monologue, you know. See, now I'm standing up a little straighter and my shoulders are relaxing just because I took a breath, you know, just because I cooled my own organs, you know, in, in inner life with a moment of relaxation. That's an act of kindness. That's going to make the world a better place. That's going to make you more centered in the moment. And then from there, from that moment of being sort of centered and present and in the now, then your choices are going to be more compassionate, right? Because you're not reacting to the voices and all the insanity, you know, of the trajectory you were on a moment ago and whatever's going on in your head, right? You're like, I'm here. What's next? You know, and, and that's where you want to be. When you're in the shower, you want to be in the shower. You don't want to be thinking about what's going to happen when you get to work and that email you got when you woke up and, you know, how bad the traffic's going to be. All those things we all do all day long, <laughs> you know. I'm not saying that stuff isn't going to be a constant obstacle. It is, right? That's why everyone's not walking around like a Buddha because it's hard. It's hard to get to that place. You know, it's simple, but it's hard if that makes any sense, right? You know, it's a simple idea that's very hard to engineer. It's like sobriety itself. It's like, it's a pretty simple program. It's pretty hard to get sober. It's pretty hard to stay sober. You have to do work. That's what attracts me about AA is it, it's like I've seen regular Joes clearly become like enlightened beings, 
you know, though they would never say that about themselves. And I don't mean they can make stuff levitate. I mean, they've clearly figured out what life is about for them. You know, they're clearly living with the idea of selfless service, you know, and we all are going to have a certain amount of egos and, and pain bodies around us at all times, but they've learned how to quiet those voices enough that they're not in the way of them being productive every day, you know, for 24 hour increments. That's doable, you know, and I've seen mechanics and plumbers and all these guys that aren't sitting around reading, you know, self-help books, get that message and then deliver it to others and, and lead very productive, you know, lives that are making this world a better place. And what more do you want? You know, and you don't have to have an addiction to participate in that. The principles are the same that you basically get in any religion. And don't get caught up on the word religion. I just mean, you know, the teachings of Jesus. Jesus. <laughs> that was the working title was Jesus, and it just didn't flow. So they went with Jesus. But uh, <laughs> Jesus, the Buddha, you know, Sufi poets, you know, pick it. You know, don't worry about the dogma or the theocracy or any of that stuff. Think about what they were saying. Think about what Jesus was saying when he was like, look at the lilies of the field. They neither toil nor spin, right? You know, well, that's what he's talking about. He's talking about presence, just being there, letting nature be. You know, Paul McCartney, let it be, right? His mother came to him in a dream, his dead mother. And that was the message, like, let it be. Leave life alone. Just let it be. Just rest in yourself and know that there's goodness that will carry you forward. You just have to tap into it. And it's free to everybody. You know, that's the good news. It's free all the time. You don't have to give 20 bucks to a preacher. You don't have to do all this catechisms and learn all this stuff. If that's your trip, go for it. If that helps you participate in what's going to transform your heart and your mind towards aligning yourself towards love, go for it. Who am I to judge? You know, all the signs point to the truth. The real mystics figure out what that truth is for themselves. You know, you got to come to really understand it and, and live it and learn it through your own personal experience. You know, that's why I talk so much, <laughs> right? Because it helps me fight it. Because I got turned on to this stuff by Joseph Campbell. If you guys know Joseph Campbell, he wrote The Power of Myth, you know, and, and he did a series in the 80s that was on PBS where he just talked about all these heroes that every culture had. And every culture sort of had the same parables, you know, the same hero's journey where you go away and then you come back home again. You know, as I was talking about before with Siddhartha or Narcissus and Goldman, you know, another Herman Hesse book that I loved. It had a huge influence on me. You know, it's like go out in the world and find it, you know. And I'm not saying that stuff because I'm trying to be a hero. I'm trying to say that humans throughout history have always had the same basic instincts, the same basic struggles, right, over sort of protecting their families or their communities or their countries, you know, with the desire to hoard things and let others suffer in the name of, well, I'm taking care of my own, so their plight is not my problem, you know. That's not the real deal, you know. The real deal is we're all connected, right? we're all going to have to kick in and make sure everybody is safe and taken care of, right? That should be the goal of everybody. You know, I always felt like sunsets should be religion, you know, and everybody should stop whatever they're doing and watch the sun go down and just take a moment to realize we're so blessed. We're alive on this planet at this time. This is a beautiful world, man. We had the opportunity to love yet again and help you know, and that's not to say there isn't suffering. Life is full of suffering. It's a part of life. The aversion to suffering and the fear of suffering and making somebody else suffer so maybe you might not have to as much in the future, that's the bad trip. You know, that's the road you don't want to go down. You know, that's where you need to find bravery in your own inner strength to realize, man, something ain't right here. You know, I don't want to think about the fact that kids are going to sleep hungry tonight, which is going to happen tonight all over the world too many times. You know, I want to make a difference towards that. I can't sit here in my 17-room mansion and enjoy my winnings, right? Because I was born into the right family, you know, or I bought the right stock option or I went to the right school. 
and things were easy for me and now I have a ton of money and I'm just going to buy a badass car and I'm going to get a badass looking wife and I'm just going to enjoy mine. You know, and I'm going to raise some asshole kids <laughs> that are going to go to some asshole school. You know, I'm just kidding. But you know what I mean? And I did well because it's me, because it's my genes. And that's what, you know, we do in my family. You know, some of that is good to an extent, but come on. The scales are so tipped at this point and tilted that most people are not getting a fair shot at happiness. They're not getting a fair shot at providing for their families and feeding their children. And that's a global problem. That's a global issue that politics can address, that the best of politics can address, and that we addressed in this midterms. You know, slap your slap yourself. Pat yourself on the back <laughs> if you got out and voted. Don't slap yourself, you know, unless you voted for a Republican and slap yourself. But uh, no, pat yourself on the back. You participated in one of the most important and consequential elections in our lifetime, you know, and the stuff isn't pretty. It wasn't, you know, victories across the board, but that's not how war works, right? This was a battle. Like, we're not done with the war, but this was a hill we needed to hold, right? We need to hold this hill for democracy. You know, this was Hamburger Hill election right here, you know? And we did it, you know? We sort of repelled the troops, you know, that were foolish, that were doing their own picket's charge, right? foolhardy and they lost in Pennsylvania again <laughs> right when, when are these confederates going to learn you know I saw somebody make that analogy I think they did it on the daily show so I didn't write that but it was good but uh you know because I was talking about Gettysburg last week I threw it in but you know the foolhardy like crime that's all anybody's going to care about we don't need a plan let's just go all in that the Democrats are bad, you know, on the backs of like, we're also going to have a national abortion ban when we get into power. And Lindsey Graham is going to decide what a woman can do with her body. And people were like, hell no. Right. No, thank you. And the young people showed up and voted. They were hobbled by gerrymandering in Texas and Florida and probably a lot of cheating. You know, I, I would love to have some real serious audits of the, you know, ES and S machines that are used in those districts. But again, like I talked about the psychological ops, you know, that Putin and MAGA have employed, you can't bring that stuff up now or you're going to sound like them. You're going to sound like the people that are, you know, saying that Biden stole the election. You know, that's, that's the real quagmire of the disinformation age that we live in that I don't have a solution towards yet, right? Because now you sound like a crazy, you know, or a blue anon, as they call it, where there probably has been a lot of actual physical cheating by the Republicans, right? Why wouldn't there be? Look at all the other things they're willing to do to, to steer an election in their favor. You don't think, you know, they're willing to tip the scales and, and use machines that have been altered? If they're not, then why didn't Ron DeSantis sort of make sure federal you know, election observers could go in there from the DG, DOJ and look at these counties? He kept them out. He said, you're not going into those counties. And those were the counties that the Russians had put the malware in, that the FBI told him they did it. So he knew a foreign government, the Russians, and Putin had interfered with Florida's elections and the DOG wanted to make sure it didn't happen in this cycle. And he said, no, stay out. Because he knew the Russians were going to help him get elected. And that's not democracy. That's not freedom. You know, that's stealing it. And that's what they want to do because they see themselves as a dwindling minority. And they know they're going to get creamed by this next generation, which is multicultural, you know, which is rejecting their sort of white Christian male is the only law and, the, the, you know, the, the rewriting of history, you know, that, that DeSantis has done that I've discussed many times on this show, how he's taken over the public education system and tried to sort of dismantle it and remake it in this propagandist Nazi, you know, forefathers were these benevolent people that we all need to worship and only white men should decide what happens, right? You know, and he'll get some generations of ignorant people, you know, growing up on Mountain Dew and, you know, Captain Crunch and whatever, and fried foods that are going to, you know, become warriors like their daddy and their ma were, you know, joining DeSantis's army. But the most part, most of the young people, the Generation Z, 
they're going to reject that, you know? And as soon as, as soon as we get more sort of facility in addressing these cultural issues, which we've now begun to do, which this election, election was, you know, we broke through this time, you know, and now it's going to get better next time. We got to go right at those cultural issues, right? And I'm going to do all I can to keep speaking out. You know, it's, it's now in my backyard, you know, and I've been aware of it and talking about it since the MAGA thing. And I, I reach across the aisle. I get in touch with my friends that skew that way. I sort of understand how it happened, you know. And, um, you know, these, these aren't bad people, you know. They, they're ignorant and they're voting against their own self-interest and they are, you know, harboring some xenophobic, racist sort of things that, that you can grow out of. You can be re-educated. You can be like, you know, I saw the light. This isn't the way to go, right? Amazing grace, you know, probably the greatest sort of spiritual gospel tune in the world was written by, you know, a slave ship captain, you know, a British guy who was like transporting human beings across oceans to do work for other people, selling human beings. You couldn't get, you know, you couldn't get lower on the totem pole of awful things, right? And he had a moment of epiphany and wrote that song. You know, that's what that song is about. I once was blind and now I can see. You know, the wounded healer, right? Changing yourself, bettering yourself, you know? That's, that's the real deal. That's where the, you know, that's where the rubber meets the road, you know? And, and why not try to inspire people to become that change, you know? To leave, you know, the, the sort of toxic mentality of the past behind and come into a future that we can all participate on in. It's going to feel good. It doesn't feel good to hold a sign on the side of the road and say Democrats or Satanists, you know? Those are your friends and neighbors, you know? It feels better to make sure everybody gets a fair shot, you know? It feels better to protect the environment instead of laughing at the Green New Deal, you know, and energy and thinking environmentalism is just woke soy boys. No, it's not. We're trying to make sure your kid doesn't get cancer, you know? We're trying to make sure there's clean food and air and water, you know, and that it's sustainable, that our agricultural practices are humane, right? That aren't going to, you know, pump us full of GMOs and horrible things that's going to prop up a pharmaceutical industry that the Republicans are going to let you, let con continue to rip you off <laughs> when you're dying. Like, you know, take all your money for your insulin, things that should just be basic, right? But they're beholden to these interests that are making the individual rich and powerful and they're making the masses suffer. And the masses are supporting it, right? Because they've been brainwashed. And we need to go in there and change that, you know? And, and I'm going to do that as much as I can. You know, I'm going to reach out to my friends that might have voted the other way this election. And I'm going to continue to try to say, hey, man, I get part of it. I get why you think that way. I get how you have come to think that way but you're getting played you're getting lied to lee zeldin does not have your best interest at heart and thankfully enough new yorkers knew that you know but that's where we're at you know there's no victory lap right because we don't we don't want to dominate the other side you know we don't want to like we won you suck that's not what it's about it's this is two hands on the same body fighting each other you know it works better when we do have sort of, you know, conservative and, and progressive, you know, and, and they sort of meet in the middle and compromise. And I, I mean old school conservative. I don't mean what we have now that I just discussed. I mean, you know, a guy like me, I'm going to want everything to be free for everybody, right? I'm going to be too radical on, on one kind of issue. You know, if you let me, you know, into, into the White House or, or Congress, you know, I'm probably going to be needed you know you're probably going to need to pull me back to the center a little bit and say hey no you know we also got to be a little prudent here and fiscally conservative like that's what you want a balance right that's when it works best right when when i can respect your point of view you can respect mine and we can come to agree agree on something in the middle that doesn't disproportionately disadvantage one side or the other you know that's what we need to get to. You know, and Biden's the guy to bring us to that. I'm sorry, but my man is kicking butt, okay? 
I, I almost think of him now as like Columbo, you know, like everybody discounts Columbo because he's kind of muttering and you're like, this guy's got a lazy eye. Like, <laughs> you know, like how does how is he on the ball? You know, that's kind of how Biden comes out. Like he, he mispronounces words and kind of stumbles. Obviously, he had a stutter he's overcoming. So you're looking at this guy, but then he's kicking ass. He's quietly getting things done. If you looked at his record, you know, just on the inflation, on the job numbers, on the health insurance, you know, reducing the deficit. Yeah, I know inflation's up, but he, he's reduced the, the deficit by half in two years. That's astronomical. Republicans will blow that all up again if you give them the chance, you know, because they'll reinstate and preserve Trump's tax cut, which was letting billionaires off the hook and keeping common folk broke and selling it is just the opposite. Biden's a guy who's not really good at selling it, but he's good at doing it. You know, we got to get out there and sell it. We got to explain to our friends and neighbors, this is what that means. This is what the Inflation Reduction Act did. And every single Republican voted against it. This is what the American Rescue Plan did. This is why you have a new construction project in your hometown and a new bridge getting built over that river that was rusting out, right? This is what that money does in your community. And that money is because of a Democratic administration in Congress. And we're all going to benefit from that. So stop calling us Satan's, Satanists, you know, and I'll stop calling you insurrectionists as long as you stop insurrectioning. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's the same thing with guns. You got to tell these guys, look, nobody's coming for your deer hunting rifle, you know, and your pistol. You know, lock it up because it's a dangerous thing to have in your home, but nobody's coming for that. But we don't want 17-year-olds and 18-year-olds buying weapons of war and walking around with them and slaughtering fellow civilians in schools and, you know, in churches and shopping centers, all of which is an epidemic in this country. You do something about it, right? We don't have lawn darts anymore because it was a dumb idea. Throwing a big piece of steel up in the air with wings on it, letting it come back down into your eye. That was a toy when I was a kid in the 70s, right? I played with those things. That was insane. We changed, right? We have issues like that now. It's not a cultural thing. It, I mean, it is a cultural thing, but it's not your birthright, should I say, right? You don't need that AR-15 to continue your grandfather's tradition of shooting his own turkey for Thanksgiving next week. You know what I mean? Okay, so, so we need to sort of reach across the aisle and just like, come on, guys, let's get real here, you know? Let's kind of come back to the center. Let's get normal about what we've been because we, we've, all, we've all been through craziness. We've all been through trauma in the last couple of years, you know? So, you know, it's nutty and, uh, you know, and that's it. It's nutty, right? But, but it's going to get better through the chaos, through the Elon Musks and the Trumps and you know, take some shot in Freud and watch him crumble because it's going to be crazy over the next two days. Rest up. Get ready for the fight. But no, you did well. No, this election went well, all things considered. And that should give us hope for the future because we got another one in two years. But I won't start, start talking about that yet. I'm going to get going because I've been talking for a while. I think it's Molly McClure was a listener who bought a T-shirt last week. Thank you very much, Molly. I shipped it out the other day. I hope you'll get it. Thank you, all you all you guys, for the Substack. Everyone's like subscribing. It's free to subscribe. You can just sign up. And many people have gotten year yearly subscriptions and monthly subscriptions, and that means more to me than you'll ever know. You know, and it supports this podcast, which is free. I know there's commercials on YouTube, but if you're listening to it, there's no commercials or anything. There shouldn't be. <laughs> Tell me if there is, because I don't get paid for that. You know, I do it for free, but that helps fund it now. And that's going to make this a lot more sustainable, especially now that Twitter's kind of going away. So Substack is a great way to follow me. You know, you just sign up, you get it in your email. I've been putting a lot of work into writing that stuff, and I'm going to do some more. I'll have another one out this weekend. But sort of the outpouring and support on that level means more than you know. You know, because it's like I do this podcast, and unless I'm doing a live show, I never see the people who are listening. It's just numbers when it gets downloaded. And my show does pretty good numbers, you know, but I, I don't like get promoted anywhere. There's nobody else, there's no celebrities. You know what I mean? It's just like, here's my podcast, you know, and now Elon's putting warnings on it. So knowing there's people out there that are digging it means more, you know, more than, than you know. And 
some of you guys I've met at live shows and, and, and when I see you in person and that it means something to you, that's love, man. That's like what we're talking about. This is a dialogue. You know, we need all hands on deck to sort of re you know, rewrite this ship. I don't even know if that's a term. But uh that's where I'm at. It's been a long week. Election went well. A lot of work going into that. A lot of stuff going on. Beautiful time of year. Indian summer is continuing. I saw bees on dandelions yesterday and dragonflies around the pond, which, to be honest, completely freaks me out. But, uh, you know, it is what it is. Let me grab the guitar. You know, it's the next issue. You know, the next thing we need to deal with is really, like, getting serious about the environment. So anyway, thanks for listening. That's episode 85 of the Noel Kassler podcast. I love you guys. Be well, and I'll see you next week. Peace.